I walked over. The elephant sat in the dirt, surrounded by shit, sparse grass, some stupid rustic stakes. I don't know what they were trying to make this elephant out to be. It was surrounded by a pen, and there were two other elephants that were preparing to go back to their shelters. I was 40 or 50 or meters away from it, and I have no idea where it was looking. Maybe it wasn't looking at anything at all. It sat there, perfectly still, made people think something was off. The pen was maybe two meters high, and I saw that it was surrounded by morsels of carrots, apples, small bits of leftover hamburger bread, and more too. I arduously climbed the fence. That was really too pitiful, because when I was eight or nine years old, I could already hop a two meter compound wall. When I jumped over, the other elephant saw me and didn't react. I ran to the sitting elephant, where the people were yelling behind me, I couldn't really hear clearly. I had to see, I had to see why it wanted to sit there, motionless. Might have been the biggest question of my life. When I got close to it, I saw its back leg it was broken. Looking at it, it must have weighed at least five tons. Even the ability to sit so still at all was so impressive. Suddenly, I began to laugh. To tell you the truth, I wanted to hug it and cry for a while, but it struck me with its trunk. It's quite strong. And it lifted one foot and brought it down towards my chest. As the zookeepers were running over, I could still see their mouths cursing something. Bell was one of the most talented young figures in all of China. Before he had even reached his 30s, he had released two novels and three short films, which were all successes in his native China. And he was finishing work on his first ever feature film, which was already getting him hype as one of the most talented young auteurs before even coming out. Then all of a sudden, it all ended. On October 12th, 2017, the young filmmaker and novelist was found dead in his apartment building, having committed suicide at the young age of 29. His last work in his sadly short career would be that debut feature titled An Elephant Sitting Still, a four hour long slow cinema behemoth discussing the lives of four characters as they deal with misery and attempt to escape the dire circumstances of their lives, influenced in part by a short story of his own by the same title. A beautiful masterpiece deserving of all the praise in the world. And while it is depressing, inside it there is optimism. And I hope through discussing this film, you can see why it's so beautiful to me, and why Hubo's legacy should live on. Before we can get into the film proper, we need to establish some important context. Hubo's only film deals in a genre colloquially known as slow cinema. Slow cinema is admittedly as loose as a genre comes. The tenets of it and what counts as part of it are often debated. The basic gist of the genre, however, are films with a hyper-slow meditative pace that utilize long takes, minimalist direction, weaponization of silence, and often all with little story. As stated, the genre is pretty loose, so finding an exact collective of filmmakers belonging to it is much more debatable than, say, Dogma 95 or the French New Wave, who had much more defined members. However, there are some filmmakers that I regularly see associated with the genre in some way. Notable examples being Andre Tarkovsky, Chantal Ackerman, Ingmar Bergman, Michelangelo Antonioni, Robert Brisson, Apichpong, Weiras Thickel, Theo Angelopoulos, and Gus Van Sant. But arguably, most quintessential to the genre of all is Hungarian filmmaker Belatar, whose most famous and also infamous work is the seven and a half hour long behemoth Sutton Tongo. Sutton Tongo is by most estimates an intimidating watch. Being a triple threat of being over three times the average film length, told at a glacial pace, and being a dark, depressing, and deeply philosophical tale, it is... an undertake. 
hell it took seven years to even finish making. And while that has reasonably put some people off, it hasn't stopped it from gaining an incredible legacy. It's received widespread acclaim since its release, appearing both on the Sight and Sound Greatest Film poll and having a perfect 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. Since then, Tara has gone on to direct several other highly acclaimed films, from Workmeister Harmonies in 2000 to his latest film, 2011's The Turin Horse, both co-directed by his editor, Agnes Ranitsky. But admittedly since 2011, it's been pretty silent on his front. Though in that hiatus, he has occasionally held seminars across the world for young filmmakers. And it's at one of those seminars where he met who... Bo. Bellatar was an idol to Hubo, who at this point had already made splashes as a novelist and was finishing production on An Elephant Sitting Still. Though at the time, he was quite discouraged after his producers had demanded he had cut down the film, to which he sadly obliged despite his desires. Meeting at the seminar, Hubo showed him his short films and informed him about what was going on with his current post-production woes. Apparently, Tar was incredibly impressed with the young director and encouraged him to continue working hard. And that inspired Hubo to continue pursuing filmmaking and writing and to continue the fight for his vision of the film. Skipping ahead a bit to the film, I think it is important to note that there's something serendipitous about Tar being the one to save the film. To say that Tar is the biggest influence on the film is an understatement. While it is Hubo's film, let's not deny that it is clearly his own artistic work. There is little doubt that Tar's approach to filmmaking was one that inspired him a lot, and while he tweaked it in ways to make it his own, and it clearly is his own film, it's fair to say that without Tar influencing Hubo, the film as we know it wouldn't have existed at all. And thus, it's fitting that Tara was one of the people to motivate Hubo to fight for the film. Sadly, his mental state would deteriorate as he continued to get pushback, and he would only get his wish for the full four-hour cut of the film to be released, after he had taken his own life. The film would finally see its first screening at the Berlin Film Festival nearly four months to the day after Hubo's death. And we'd finally see the film Hubo had poured his entire self into, the way he intended it, his final statement to the art world. The story focuses on four central characters whose lives have spiraled out of control. The first we meet being Yu Chang, played by the actor Yu Zhang, a gang leader currently sleeping with his best friend's wife. He feels incredibly guilty, but it seems the only solace he has in his life is the time he spends with her. Sadly, during his first scene in the film, his best friend comes home and finds out about the affair. His best friend takes one look at him, asks if it's true, and jumps from the balcony to his death, committing suicide. With the video as heavy as it already is, I hope you all can understand why I don't feel comfortable showing this sequence. The importance of this scene is obvious. In one quick spell, Chang has been robbed of his best friend and the one comfort in his life, and it's all his fault. And it's in his guilt that he decides to venture to Manzuli to see the mythical elephant that sits still that his best friend one day wanted to see. Next we meet Wei Bu, played by Yu Chang Peng, a loner boy in an abusive poor household. His father and mother are using their free time to mock him and accuse him of ruining their lives. At school, he and his best friend are bullied relentlessly by Yu Chang's younger brother. His best friend often makes attempts to fight back, even showing off a pistol to Boo early on. But he never has the confidence to really do anything, and thus the cycle continues. At least until this day, when Boo himself decides to fight back in the most inopportune of places. As far as anyone is concerned, 
Abu is at fault. He's assaulted a fellow student so badly, he's ended up in the hospital with a severe head injury. It doesn't help that Yu Chang wants to avenge his brother. Or at least, Yu Chang's mother wants Yu Chang to avenge his brother. Regardless, Yu Chang will stop at nothing to hurt Wei Bu. He has no choice but to run. Meanwhile, Wei Bu's day intersects heavily with his neighbor Wang Jin, played by Kong Ji Li. An older man and veteran, he owns and lives in the same house as his son, his son's wife, and his granddaughter. Despite them not owning the house themselves, they insist they cannot take care of both him and their daughter and that he must move out to a nursing home, despite him not really being in any state of needing that level of care. But he goes on a walk considering it, with his closest companion, his dog. On the way home, they come across a woman looking for her lost dog. They shrug, move on, and end up actually finding the lost dog. As it approaches with a rabid look, and mauls Jin's dog to death, he too is now alone and facing losing his home. And finally, we have Wei Bu's classmate Wang Ling, played by Uven Wang, whom we are introduced to last. A young girl with a single alcoholic mother who often accuses her of everything that goes wrong around her, despite Ling having to be the adult of the house. Ling is currently having an affair with the vice dean behind his wife's back for preferential treatment. As one of the students at a failing school, she views this as her only way out, only to discover that one of their sessions has been videotaped without their consent and posted online. The vice dean passes the blame onto her, despite the fact that he lied to her about being divorced and also that as an adult and her vice dean, he obviously has the power in the situation. This basically being a coercive situation between a minor and an adult. Regardless, his wife bursts into Ling's house, screaming at Ling through her door, claiming that she seduced her husband. And as Ling's mother does very little to stick up for her daughter, Ling has to escape out of a window. It's then that we witness one of the most cathartic and beautiful scenes I've ever seen in a film where we see one character fight back against all of the terrors in her life in just one brief, violent moment. Ling finally stood up and took action, but the damage is done, and it's not going to get any better. At this point, everyone in the film has lost any place to go. Boo is most likely going off to prison. Ling most likely is too. I mean, she just assaulted two people. If she's not, she's probably not going to be able to move on to another high school with her infamy. Chang has lost the girl he loved, his best friend to suicide, he lives a sad life of crime he resents, and now his kid brother is in the hospital. And Jin lost his only companion and will most likely be sent to a nursing home. They are sad, depressed people with nowhere left to go. And they all seek to visit the elephant. To see something no one can understand. To give them meaning. Wei Bu and Yu Chang both learn of the elephant independently, but Wei Bu informs both Wang Jin and Huang Ling of it. Wang Jin first as he sells him the pool cue that he will carry for the rest of the film and will put him in the crosshairs of Yu Chang and Huang Ling on her way to her date with the vice dean. At first both seem to dismiss the idea as a farcical exchange but both eventually wish for one last trip to restore hope. The story of why they all seek the elephant is interesting. Some may ask why an elephant sitting still is any bit special. Well, it's kind of simple. It refuses to move. Ever. People whip it, harm it, and yet it doesn't move. In the short story, it's because of the broken leg. It's a spectacle and a false one. But in the film, it's a far-off image of real optimism. Not that everything will be okay, but that something amazing 
is out there. While we're paused, though, I'd like to take a minute to discuss the style and presentation of the film. Because I simply adore it. The film is four hours long, and it isn't exactly a brisk four hours either. It is incredibly slow-paced, so already that's going to be a big turnoff for most people. But I'd argue the film is the length it needs to be. The film is full of quiet moments, walking, scenes of just score accompaniment, but that all sort of builds a character to the film. Sure, you could maybe tell the story in an abbreviated form and keep all the story elements, but you'd lose the living, breathing world it creates. The film doesn't just tell you the long-term consequences of things. You sit with them. This takes place over one day, and you get to see time pass in real time. You don't just get to cut to the cinematic moments. You have to feel the dread with them. One of the most powerful statements of the film comes from a shot just like this. As we travel through the retirement home, Wing Jin is to be set off to, as he can only watch and see what his life is about to become, and how he is not ready to go there. And in that, you see the characters. You see them in their silent moments, all alone, not knowing how to absorb the world. Their tiny conversations, their relationships, and how the story has affected all of that. No time is wasted in doing that. It's not like these characters are taking a break from the story. It's there. But with each conversation, you see how there are changes, and how they react, and who they are to different people. And I'm glad we get that time. I wouldn't have it any other way. Filmmaking is also incredibly vivid. The use of mostly steady cam shots and the art of following characters' motion, eye line, while not being afraid to get close up, is visually stunning. You look through their eyes, you feel like you're beside them, that you can see their perspective. The desire of these long takes is not to be showy, but rather to show you an uncut view of what the character's perspective looks like. You can't cut away in real life, so scenes just carry on. It all feels so personal, which makes the ending feel so much more powerful. It all comes to a head when Weibu attempts to buy tickets to Manzuli from a scalper. Only for that scalper to be a part of Yu Chang's gang. They trap him and call Chang over. But Yu Chang doesn't care anymore about his brother, about anything. His brother is dead. But he doesn't even care anymore. He just feels lost. Instead, he asks Weibu where he was planning to go. He hears about how he had the same idea to go to Manzuli. Yu Cheng tells his men to get Weibu his tickets, saying he'll let him go, but that things will catch up to him eventually. And then Weibu's friend from earlier comes into the scene. Remember that pistol from earlier? Well, this time... It's loaded. Boo's friend shoots Chang accidentally in the struggle. And at first he's proud. He feels powerful. In disgust, Boo walks away, leaving his friend to sit with himself and realize what he's done. Chang can only sit with the bullet in his leg and watch as Boo's friend puts the gun to his head and takes his own life. Wei Bu, Wang Jin, Wang Jin's granddaughter, and Wang Ling head off to Manzuli to see the elephant. They take a few buses, they transfer between lines, and they finally make it to Manzuli, late at night. They don't go to the zoo yet. They simply hang around and play shuttlecock. Until... This 
is one of the most powerful endings of a film I've ever experienced. It hit me like a truck the first time I saw it. I never thought just a sound effect could be so transcendent, but I'll always tear up at that sound now. These characters' lives are fucked up beyond repair, almost certainly headed for misery. And yet they travel all this way to see one animal. To see hope, everything here is miserable. As Yu Chang states earlier in the film. <laughs> but in this one moment, they've traveled out to see one thing. One thing beyond their imagination. And they got it. There's a lot of depressing things about this movie. It's a thoroughly sad and harrowing journey told by a man who saw an ugly, ugly world he didn't quite admire. But it's one with hope. Hope for something. Hope for the future. It's really there. And it's a shame Hubo couldn't see that in the end. Hubo's story hits me hard. I mean, I didn't know. I don't claim to at all. But I know that story. I've lost people close to me to suicide. It fucking hurts! Because all you want to do is go back and tell them that you love them, that you're gonna miss them, that they do make a difference and it's just better that they're around. And you just can't. And... I've had to deal with depression myself. It's a storm of hopelessness that makes you feel like nothing will ever get better. It sucks. Recently I got back on medication that worked for me after several meds that didn't and I do feel stable again. But I can't help but see myself in Hubo. Hubo was an artist and a real breathing human being. He wasn't a symbol or a character, he was just a person. And he's gone now. Leaving behind a legacy of art and a host of what-ifs. But if I've learned anything from his only feature film, it's that there is hope in a miserable world. That we as people can make it out of here happy. And while Hubo is no longer with us, his film is. And I hope by sharing it, sharing this piece of beauty, one of my favorite films ever, that I can maybe inspire people to create, to love, but most importantly to hope for those who can't anymore, for those we've lost, to keep going. It's hard, but I promise I'll keep trying, and I hope you can too. I'd like to end with a quote from Bellatar. We've talked a lot about his influence on Bo, but very little about Bo's impact on him. A protege he wished he had more than a few meetings with. And I think his words ring true. Dear friends, I'm deeply sorry I couldn't be at this screening with you and my students, my friend, my nearest and dearest. I'm writing this message from the same hotel where I met him. Hundreds of Chinese filmmakers applied to work with me, but when I met him, I knew this was it, without any doubt. He was full of dignity and amazing to work with. His eyes showed an uncommonly strong personality. Anyway, I don't want to talk about my feelings. I just wanted to tell you that I met a person with a broad vision of the world. During our last meeting in Wuhan, he showed me his cast and locations and gave me his book. He wrote a dedication to my godfather. Shit. I feel guilty I couldn't protect him properly. It's a shame. But how can one protect a person constantly surrounded by a storm? He wrote books, scripts, plays. Horrible. Without end. While working, however, he was very sensible and kind. He listened to everybody and paid attention to detail. He was constantly in a rush. Maybe he knew he didn't have much time. He burned his candle at both ends. He wanted to have everything right now. He couldn't accept the world and the world couldn't accept him. Though we lost him, his movies will be with us forever. 
please welcome Hubo's film and love him like I do. Thanks to my $10 a month patrons, Corey Fui Maona, Eric, Karen Kanaki, Paige, Trent Maudier, Laura M, Felicity, and Maxi Bomb. <laughs>